text of our message is from the epistle reading, focused in on the last verse. Ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. This is the word of God. Please be seated. On January 24th of this year, Ryan Hensley and his son were driving through their Cincinnati neighborhood. They were on a quest. They were trying to track down the son's car, which had been stolen. And they were using an a, a app on the phone called Bouncy, and apparently that gives you information about the car, and it was allowing them to follow where that stolen car was going in the city. They were tracking that car. Until something went wrong, I don't know if a battery died or the app didn't do its thing, didn't uh, get its information from the satellite or whatever, but they, they thought they had lost it. When suddenly they noticed off to the side, parked by the side of the road, was that stolen car. And they called 911 and they found it full of stolen goods and the thief was taken in and they got their property back. They were able to track down that vehicle and have back what they had lost. Tracking. Tracking is the art or science of following clues in order to discover Something. And in our text today, St. Peter invites us on a tracking mission. We're tracking some things down. And we'll describe this in three points today. The first one is about going astray. The second one is about knowing Christ's steps, recognizing the steps of Jesus. And the third is about following in Christ's steps. Now, the first one we're all familiar with, right? Because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Peter has in mind Isaiah chapter 53, describing us as human beings and our ways as sinners. Every one of us is born into sin, the scripture warns. And we're prone to wander off from the way of our Lord. We tend to be quick to recognize sin in others and slow to recognize sin in ourselves. We're like a herd of humanity, wandering, lost, bleeding blame at one another, right? It's your fault that we don't know where we are. No, it's your fault, right? This is humanity as a mass in this world, bleeding that blame. Understand Peter's focus for us we must understand his setting, what things were like for his first readers and hearers of this letter. Peter is writing to a very specific group of Christians. They are household slaves. Okay? There are slaves that would work in those days. This is the Roman Empire, right? They would work in the fields, work in mines, places like that, maybe owned by the government. But these were a class of slaves that worked in the household, and they were generally a little bit more privileged than the other types of slaves. But they find themselves in a difficult situation. They're owned by these masters, working in their households, but for one reason or another, the masters are being rough with them. And they are suffering. They're suffering. And Peter gives two reasons why they might be suffering as he teaches with them. The first is that it might be because you did something wrong, okay? And the master's upset with you, and if you suffer that way, well, you shouldn't be surprised. But there was a second way of suffering that they were experiencing, and that was suffering because they were Christians. Suffering because they believed in Jesus Christ. Suffering because they believed certain principles of right and wrong and tried to follow those in their lives. 
They were trying not to go astray. Trying to walk in that Christian life, struggling as we all do, right? We have our good days and our bad days, every single one of us. And as we think about the situation, the trouble that these early Christians were in, we should also think about ourselves and how when we go astray and how when we face suffering, even persecution in this world, Like sheep, we need our herd, right? Sheep are a herd animal. You need to run with your herd. But sheep are also very hungry animals, right? And nobody's going to stuff the food in your mouth out there in the pasture. You've got to go get it yourself. And they put their heads down and nibble away, and it becomes so easy under those circumstances to wander, to wander off from the flock. They need a balance in their life. They need to have one eye on that grass, the things they're pursuing, their appetite, the things they want, right? And one eye on their flock to, so they can stay in touch with them. And it's the same way with us, dear friends in Christ. We all have appetites, things we want to pursue in life, things that are important to us, for one reason, for another. Some of them are good, some of them are not. And they can draw us astray. And we have to be careful that we're keeping also an eye out for our herd, watching our steps. And when I say the herd, I don't mean the world and its ways, okay? That's astray. I'm talking about God's church. I'm talking about God's people. It's interesting. Uh, Peter describes the experience of these early Christians, and he points out some things that they should not do, things that the world would do that they should not do. He mentions in particular reviling in the King James, which means mocking. Okay? Don't mock. And the other is Beguiling, which is another word for lying, okay? Deceiving, right? They're getting in trouble. Maybe they're trying to lie their way out of it somehow. Beating and destroying down that household in their sins. Don't follow the crowd. Don't follow the crowd, folks. Follow the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow the Lord's ways. Be gathered to your good shepherd. Don't learn those ways of the world. Thinking about our families here in Emmanuel now and what it is that we're facing. We're, because of this virus, we are separated from one another. And in that sense, we have some danger about going astray. All right. Not coming to the Lord for prayer, not remembering the Sabbath day. And I want to encourage you to remember your children and your grandchildren and your brothers and sisters in Christ as we are separated physically from one another. And perhaps do something like this. Pick up your phone or get on your email. Contact them. Ask them how it's going. Ask them if they've said their daily prayers. If they haven't, invite them to pray with you. I'm doing this on the phone about every day of the week now, calling people and praying with them on the phone. And if you don't know what to say, I've got the perfect prayer for you. It's called the Lord's Prayer. Okay? You all know it by heart, right? At least I hope you do. And you can always, when all else fails, say that Lord's Prayer with that brother or sister, that child or grandchild, that the sheep might not go astray, but that their hearts might be set on the way of our Lord. So, enough about going astray. Let's talk about that second thing that Peter is tracking here in this part of his letter, and that's the ways of Christ. And he gives details to us about that in verses 21 to 24. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 
who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. There's the tracks of our Lord Jesus Christ. The trail that he has left for us. Peter says this is an example. Identify that example and follow in that way. Patient in suffering. Persistent in righteousness. Doing what is good before your God. It's interesting. What Peter describes here is very specific to what's happening in the life of Jesus. It goes back to that Monday, Thursday evening, the, light, the night when he instituted the Lord's Supper. He went out to pray at the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's when he was betrayed by Judas and arrested and taken in and ends up on that cross on Good Friday. And these are the events that Peter has in mind as he remembers the example of Jesus. The early Christians took note of this. And in the fourth century, when Christianity became free and they were able to do things openly and publicly, they began to gather in Jerusalem when it was Holy Week. And they would walk this pathway, following the footsteps of Jesus. And that pathway was called the Via Della Rosa, the Way of Sorrow. And it starts at a church there on the Mount of Olives, and it takes you down to Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed and was arrested. And then it takes you out to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where, where good indication is that is where Jesus was laid to rest in that tomb in the garden. Following the ways of our Lord Jesus Christ. We just did this in the season of Lent, didn't we? That's what Lent is about. Following Jesus through those times of suffering. Meditating and praying upon the meaning of that suffering. Right? Christianity is not a sadistic religion. right? We don't revel in suffering. Suffering, though, often has a purpose. And the suffering of Jesus had this purpose in your life. Bring about your redemption. You would be called the sons and daughters of God. To run with his herd. And that brings us, folks, to the third track that Peter talks about in our passage this morning. I'll read that. It's end of verse 24 to the end of the passage. By his stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray but are not returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. That's why you're here today, isn't it? It's because the Lord has turned you by his voice, by his word, called you to follow him. Christ is risen. He is risen. They are walking in the pathway of the shepherd of our souls. By his stripes, Peter said. You are healed. I want you to think about this in terms of what we have laid out before us here, the body and blood of Christ. It was a wound, right, that brought about your redemption. Think about a blood transfusion. You go to the hospital, you're sick, you're in need, you're dying, and a wound is open to bring about your healing. So it was with Jesus, that suffering of his had meaning and had purpose to bring life and salvation to you. The blessings of following in the way, that track of your Lord. Next he says that he's the shepherd of your soul. He knows where to go. He knows how to lead. And the Lord is leading you today by his life-giving word, that rod and that staff that comforts us as we travel with our good shepherd. Leave that way of the world behind and run with the herd of God's people. And finally, he says that Jesus is the bishop. That means overseer of our souls. The overseer of our souls. Think about a sheep, right? How they're built. They're about 
are about yay tall, and their heads are designed to go down to the ground, right? They're not very good at being lookouts, these sheep. But the shepherd stands tall, and he sees all horizons, all directions. He knows the past, right? What you've been through, what you've suffered, what you've struck. He knows the right and the left, where you could go astray, and he knows your end. He's going to lead you through that valley of the shadow of death to that far green hill, the good pastures that he has for you, brothers and sisters, in our Lord Jesus Christ. See that horizon today. See that far green hill, the endless pastures of heaven. I started out the sermon today talking about a father and a son tracking a thief. And it ends today with a father and a 